Marina, we are very, very happy um, to have you join uh, the UVA School of Architecture today. Um, Marina is uh, Marina del Marmol is a Spanish architect, uh, graduated from Etsam uh, in 2005, uh, and uh, in collaboration with Mauro Bravo during the last uh, 15 years, have really developed a prolific body of work, uh, of which a huge component is uh, linked to notions of housing, uh, domesticity, and in particular, focusing on three things that I personally find uh, quite fascinating. Uh, the first one is the role of housing uh, within the realm of the compact city. Uh, and I think this for me is extremely important uh, in how the work is not just about sort of addressing housing deficiencies, but also how housing builds uh, fragments of cities. Uh, and that for me is, uh, is extremely uh, uh, important. Uh, I think another part of uh, uh, the practice that I find fascinating in looking at your work, uh, Marina, is the way that you build from one project to the next. That housing becomes as much sort of a, 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 delivery, a project delivery, but also a space for learning within the office, uh, which I think sort of ties directly uh, with a lot of the, the work that we're doing in all the housing studios. Uh, here at, a, um, a, a, at UVA. Uh, and I think finally, the third point, uh, which uh, I find quite uh, uh, admirable, uh, is this idea of pushing the boundaries and asking, I think, a very general but important question, which is how do we actually live collectively today? Uh, which I think is great in your work. So uh, Marina, there are too many awards uh, uh, and first prizes that you've won that, uh, um, uh, uh, there are too many to list, uh, uh, but of course, uh, it's extremely important for us to uh, uh, be able to be in dialogue with uh, practices like yours. I'm very thankful also to Inez uh, and Luis Pancorvo for the introduction uh, in, for having you at the school here today. So welcome, uh, and we're very much looking forward, Marina, to uh, your work today. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you see the screen? No? It's okay. Perfect. Thank yeah, you. perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Felipe, for this opportunity. I'm very excited to be giving a lecture at UVA. I've heard a lot of good things about the school. I'm going to introduce myself and our office. We are a young office as we started about 15 years ago. And uh, just when we finished college, we won our first uh, competition. Uh, it was going to be our first uh, collective housing project. And nowadays, this is the this is a kind of things that uh, we are passionate about. We are specialized in collective housing. And we are an office whose main uh, works have been won by competition. 90% of those competition are public social uh, competition. I'm going to... Uh, focus my lecture in five different concepts that concern us in our office. And I'm going to try to explain you how we deal with this uh, concept in a specific way in each project. The first uh, one, I'm going to extend a bit more, uh, is an urban friendly scale. The first one. In this image, uh, the old city center of an European city, uh, for example, Amsterdam. For our office, uh, this is an example about how to think an image, a city, from everyday people's perspective. We believe it is very important to take a human scale into consideration when we design a project because the architecture around us affect how people feel. Often, 
new urban planning and strategies ignore the need to create these spaces that are appealing to our senses from a pedestrian perspective. And some urban planning strategies give a priority to speed, functionality, and obviously developer profits. When we design our project, one of the first uh, thing about, uh, we think about is the human scale of the building site. In order to make buildings with a more urban friendly scale, we try to transform the quality of the building environment. Here you can see our first build project, Vallecas uh, 47. It was uh, the first competition we won uh, just after we finished college. And I will tell you uh, more about it later at the end of the lecture. And this is the most uh, recent competition we won in Seville. It's a social housing project. Uh, Seville is in the south of Spain. And here I'm going to start talking to you about the strategies uh, we developed in order to get an urban friendly escape. The site is really interesting because it's just in front of an old uh, beer company uh, called Cruz Campo. The beer company has moved its operation to a newer site in the suburb, and this building is going to be remodeled into a school of making craft beer and gourmet spaces. In that area, there are also going to be uh, shops, so there will be a lot of activity around uh, this public square. This is the plot. Uh, of our project, and this is the volume proposed by Sony Regulation, which is uh, nine story high. We try to reduce uh, the scale uh, of the building, uh, reduce the height in the southern part of the of the building, and open uh, the courtyard to the pedestrian street. We gave uh, the building more depth on the northern part of the block, recovering the maximum uh, amount of floor area allowed on that zoning lot. And we also uh, gave the volume more complexity by dividing the northern part into four different volumes and staggering the southern part of the building from seven to three uh, stories high, helping it uh, more with the surrounding area. Here you can see an image of the building, a lower stair-like volume to the south, which is uh, more connected to the public square. At the top, you can see that there are community roof uh, top terrace. And just behind those roof, behind those roof terrace, you can see the north uh, northern part volume that it's going up, uh, overlooking the south. And you can see through this uh, volume through these uh, common spaces. This uh, is a reference image that we had in mind when we start with the next project I'm going to show you. It's a large facade in, um, on Cuchilleros Street, in the old city center of Madrid. And it's interesting for us because the folding surface strategy creates diversity in the city. The next few projects I'm going to show you um, are located in that uh, um, working class neighborhood area in Madrid, 
this district called uh, Vallecas. And this is uh, an area where a uh, building was uh, built with a uh, very low quality and only after 30 years uh, the government uh, has to had to uh, demolish this part and it's uh, all this area uh, it's uh, in a very consolidated consolidated district with no more than four story high and six story high but uh, the zoning plan proposed us uh, that uh, 10 story high building. We won uh, our second competition with this social housing project, this time with 102 dwellings. And I think this is the most complex uh, urban project we have ever designed because this particular building is actually nursery between four existing buildings. Here you can see the party walls of the existing building. And the project connects uh, our building to the surrounding building through five different contact, contact points, creating four different uh, patios, uh, courtyards. Our building is almost 100, 20 meters long uh, is 394 feet. And the topography of the building site is actually quite complicated as there is six meters, uh, 19 feet of difference in height between the southern and the northern side of the building. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a bit about the strategy we use uh, for this project. I like this image a lot. On the left-hand side, you can see a column designed by Michelangelo for St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. And on the right-hand side of the slide, we see a floor plan of uh, the chart of St. Charles at the Four Fontaines by Italian architect Francesco Borromini. Both drawings are at the same scale. If you look inside the column, you can see the size of a stair. This image helped me to express that size is a relative concept. Everything depends on perception. We can also look at two buildings that are actually the same size, although one of them uh, seems much bigger. The same size uh, of a building can be perceived like this, with the uh, small common window. It's a very typical size uh, of window in uh, social housing, or a building of the same size can look like this too. Here we see that the perception of the scale is smaller. So it appears to be a smaller building, although it is not. Here is the elevation of the project. You can see how we work uh, with the size shape and the spacing of the window for the building to break things up a bit. We designed bigger and wider windows and then we staggered them throughout the facade. So there were no identical windows piled, piled on top of each other. The two strategies we use uh, in this uh, project um, uh, scale of perception and um, folding surface, we create a visual effect of diversity using the design to capture uh, different streams of light and shade. And we also try to reduce the scale of the building. So when this competition was first announced, 
The zoning plan proposed an open linear block, but we were not a big fan of that idea. And it's a good thing because we actually won the competition uh, with a very different idea. And after a few years, the Department of City Planners uh, finally approved our idea through a special permit. And we modify the use and bulk uh, regulation. I'm showing you this building because it's an urban reference for our office. It was designed by a Spanish architect called Zuazo. The building is called La Casa de las Flores, the house of flowers. What is interesting uh, for us is the corner of the building because it's a large building with a very simple volume, but it has an urban friendly scale in the corner with the setback above the ground floor. Um, that strategy reduced the scale of the building. This large terrace also release activity and from the street, uh, you can see life uh, and people can see you on the street. There is a kind of relationship between public and private space, spaces. We try to introduce that idea uh, in the next project we want in that uh, same urban area. As you can see, the project is a very large building, uh, 105 meters long, it's about 345 feet. And this particular project has 131 dwellings. And the location of this plot means that our building will be connecting to separate the street. We start uh, the project with this volume proposed by Sony Regulation, which was eight story high and 15 meters depth. Uh, 49 feet. We divide the block into two parts and always one of its volume reduces the scale related with the, exist the existing building in the site or how the building in that part is also related with uh, this part of the city creating uh, a shape like two hills adapt to the side and we call this project Twin Peaks. This is uh, an image of the competition and here you can see how we uh, stagger the cornice and also we try to design the top floor in such a way to make it seem uh, like a different volume. Nowadays, we are building this project. It's almost finished, but I don't have uh, photos to show you in this lecture, maybe in a future. In these slides, um, I show you uh, other competition we won this project, uh, La Scala, we call the STIR. Uh, we won in 2010 and um, is 120. In this slide, you can see the building volume uh, that was originally proposed by the Sony regulation for a massive 10 story high building block. But uh, the plot side led us to design a building with a snake like floor plan in order to get best quality for our dwellings with cross ventilation and more light. And we design also these three open courtyards. As we have more square meters per floor, we can set back part of the volume, taking off some dwellings on the last floor. And the volume is staggered and we reduce the height on the southern side of the plot. In that way, we are able to fit the maximum 
gross area allowed on that zoning load. But, um, and here you can see more sun comes into, into the plot and the surround and the building is only five story high in the southern part and is higher in the northern uh, part of the, of the volume. It seems like it's only uh, four story high in the south part because the building is uh, floating from an open ground floor. We try to design the project from the pedestrian perspective and the strategy we used to do this were to reduce the scale of the building and to make a complex and interesting volume. And this way of thinking improves the human experience uh, in cities. We've uh, just finished uh, this building uh, and the photos I'm going to show you uh, yes, we take the last week and you're going uh, to be the first one to see it. Here you can see uh, the Esther part of the building. Uh, we can see only one of the three open courtyards. This is the floor plan of the building. This is like a snake. Uh, like a snake floor plan. And this is the main entrance of the building. Uh, it is this part of the building. This uh, is another perspective from the uh, west, uh, western part of the building. Uh, you can see the two, two open courtyards in that photo. And here is the south part, the southern part of the volume, uh, which is uh, smaller. It looks like four story, uh, floating with, uh, over this open ground floor. For us, the ground floor is very important in the office because um, we, we usually expend too much time uh, to design it because we thought that is one of the more urban part of the project. We try to foster this visual connection between common spaces of the project and the city, um, private and public spaces in a continuous way. And we also try to make uh, several access, creating the most uh, number of contact points that it's possible. Uh, contact points uh, from the project to the city. Here you can see is the main car access, the, the access by car. Also could be a secondary pedestrian access. We also wanted to get a very cozy space under the porticos of the building. To do this, we reduce the height of this space and we try to create diversity with different materials on the floor surface uh, with the landscape and with the ceiling surface. There are also compressive spaces and open spaces to the sky through which you can walk continuously. The ground floor is also a transition floor. It's a, a structured transition floor between the dwelling order and the parking garage order. It's a transition floor between the public and the private spaces. We also design the ground floor as a sequence of different uh, spaces where different things could happen. For example, in the left-hand side, you can see a uh, secondary access. Uh, you can see the shape of the ceiling surface. surface. Um, but 
if you keep walking down the ground floor, there is an open space to the sky, the courtyard. And the next uh, type of space is related to the main entrance of the building. It's a space with different qualities. There are uh, spaces of shade, of shade and very light spaces. This is the entrance gate, the access uh, to the vertical core of the building, we, where you can see how we design uh, this visual connection from inside to outside to the city and how we work with uh, different materials on floor and ceiling surface, surfaces. Also, we designed the landscape uh, on the ground floor. And this is the, uh, how it looks uh, in, from the upper levels. And for us, uh, it's important to foster uh, this relationship between the common spaces in the building. Um, for example, from the horizontal corridors to the courtyard, this one, um, the horizontal corridors um, uh, have a shape of like a, a snake also. And they are only in the extreme of agrupation uh, for this building, there, there is only one uh, horizontal corridor uh, with only one vertical core. But uh, the corridor, uh, the corridor to access to 12 different dwellings per floor, and it's a large corridor, but uh, we design like a sequence of uh, spaces also. There are spaces uh, of shadow, and there are spaces uh, with light because it's an open corridor. Um, the light uh, go inside from the open courtyard. You can see the end of the corridor, but it's a light space uh, at the end because there is another open courtyard in that part of the building. From this corridor, you can access to dwelling uh, for both uh, sides. And for example, in the other part of this corridor, you can uh, see other part of the volume because it's open to the views. And we try to, to get this quality of common spaces in the building. The second concept I would like to introduce in the lecture, uh, we call uh, when the building meets the, meet the street. I saw you this uh, reference image, uh, the well-known painting by um, Edward Hopper, uh, Night Hawks, to tell you about the quality uh, that has to be on a ground floor, the quality of transparency between the building and the city, and the quality of the activity from inside to outside, the need to release activity, from the building to the city. If you remember this project I saw you before, we have uh, four courtyards in, the, in this project and we try to open uh, the pedestrian access and the car access to the views connected the courtyards to the city. We try to connect in several points with the city because this project could be a project with only one uh, pedestrian access, but we try to foster, to foster that uh, uh, connection to the city. And because of that, we try to create uh, the most uh, contact, contact points uh, possible in this building. Also, we uh, propose uh, this commercial 
uh, activity to release activity to the city. You can see the um, section of this building, the patios, the uh, courtyards, and you can see uh, through these green spaces in the row. And the um, commercial activity related to the city. Nowadays, we are building also this project. And with this uh, reference image, I, I would like to tell you that uh, the quality of the um, transparency or um, the, the capacity to cross uh, the building in the ground floor to connect maybe uh, the city to a courtyard or to an open space inside your building. And this helped me to explain you uh, this other project uh, that we want in Barcelona. It's also a, a social housing project in Barcelona with uh, 50 dwellings. And it's a very simple volume because it has only 12 meters depth, uh, is 39 feet. And we try to uh, open completely the ground floor from one part, uh, one facade to another facade. And in the S part is the public square. Usually, you can connect only uh, to this part, but we fostered to connect to the other part, the street in the west uh, side. This is the ground floor of the building. And we designed these three main axes to four vertical cores in the building. And try to connect the building to different points in the city. You can cross the building and you can access from one part or other part of the city. This is how it looks, the building is a model we did. And this is another reference image I would like to show you. Uh, it's uh, a, a street in the old city center of Seville in the south of Spain. If you see, it's a pedestrian street. It's very narrow, um, but it's, it's a good space to walk. It's a good space in the city because uh, it's a shady space. In the south of Spain, it's very hot and some part of the years, you need this kind of public spaces. Also, uh, you can see the canopies uh, on the top side. And for this uh, competition we won in Seville, we try to uh, create that kind of access space in the building. We access uh, from this courtyard full of plants. Uh, with a uh, shaded space. In the ground floor, we uh, create this uh, commercial space related to the pedestrian street I saw you at the beginning. And I pass to the third concept I would like to tell you is uh, creating community because we are, uh, we are designing collective housing project. And this is uh, a reference image. Uh, it's very typical in Spain. Uh, we call La Fresca. And it's a social act in the street. Usually when, uh, when after sunset, uh, neighbors, uh, go out to the street, maybe with uh, their own chairs, tables or drinks, and spend some time in community. And we think in the main cities, uh, we lost this uh, quality 
of the common spaces, and we try to uh, get that quality in our buildings in collective housing project. This building, uh, the competition in Seville, this is the ground floor. I'm going to explain uh, briefly uh, the main access uh, from here to the courtyard, but there is also a secondary access to this public square and also three different access to the northern uh, part, uh, the main street with traffic. And this is the access by car. And you can see cross the plot to the public square. Uh, you can go to three different vertical cores, and from this different vertical cross uh, core, uh, you can cross from the northern part of the building to the southern part with this uh, corridor cross the patio, and we try to get th this kind of spaces, the rooftop terrace in the southern part of the building, in order to get this kind of spaces where neighbors can um, uh, relate it, uh, with each other and expand some moments in community. And this part of the building, the rooftop terrace, are the part uh, more related with the public square of the, uh, in the city. The fourth uh, concept I'm going to talk about is the concept of evolutionary housing. We think uh, that, okay, we know the revolution of Spain, and I think that especially the revolution of housing is more worried about minimum than possibilities. We drag a very strict housing program that sets the parameters of use and minimum size of its space. And this regulation was made more than 50 years ago. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, more types of families and we are using housing in a different way. In this project, Seville project, we try, to, we try to develop this concept and we define uh, three different, different principles in order to get an evolutionary housing. The first principle uh, is a flexible housing. It's not new. I think every architect uh, deal with this aspect in some point. But we try to develop some tools to get this uh, principle. The first one is the double circulation. Uh, we think that if you are able to get this double circulation, uh, your housing is going to seem uh, bigger and you can transform the use of this space easily. Uh, the second one uh, is the global perception of the house. Uh, we, uh, we understand this idea like a sequence of spaces, interior spaces and exterior spaces. And after that, you can uh, overlook uh, the views. We have to design with uh, very small windows uh, with a small housing because it's social housing but we try to get uh, to we try to get tools to uh, make bigger the the housing also we try to expand the interior space of the house to the exterior space um, um, erasing the limits between inside and outside. 
This is a section of this project. You can see the sequence of the space, um, the terrace, the cross ventilation that is really important. And this is an image we, we did for the competition. We imagine uh, the interior of the house in this way, no? like a sequence of spaces, uh, very open to the exterior space of the house, overlooking the trees. Also, we try to design the strip uh, of bedrooms with uh, very, in a very flexible way, because we think the housing has to uh, have the capacity to adapt the space of the house. It depends on the cycle of life. And also uh, this uh, strip uh, of the bathroom is very related with the second principle she, uh, we define in this competition is the elastic housing. And we thought that the house can change the limit of the housing. It depends, maybe you need a bigger house or a smaller house. And if we design this kind of strip uh, of bedroom with this uh, flexibility, it's possible to change the limit of the house. The third principle is an atomicized dwelling. And I'm going to explain you what's mean for us, this concept. If you look this part of the building, we have three different housing with three access. But if we are able in our project to create new access, it, uh, we are able to create new use in the building. And maybe these use uh, are going to be a space for work, for work uh, or maybe home assistant for senior. Uh, this is a um, renovation we did in the center of Madrid. I'm going to show you because uh, we developed some ideas I saw you before. Uh, in the left-hand side, you can see the old access of the dwelling, uh, very close access, but they dream of the sea. And we, uh, in the renovation, we open completely the space, uh, like this sequence of spaces, uh, connected the interior of the house to an exterior space. We try to get this diagonal in this space and erase completely the limit between inside to outside. Also, we play with the idea of a global perception of the house and maybe from a bedroom, you can see through the wardrobe to the exterior space. For us, it's very important the exterior space uh, in housing. And this is uh, the fifth concept for us, the exterior space of the house. The, this exterior space could be a terrace, or could be a patio, or could be a garden. In Barcelona project, we, we are in this neighborhood. Uh, all these old housing are going to be demolished. And these uh, neighbors are going to live in this kind of blocks. We have to design one of its blocks. And the old housing only have one story high, but all the houses uh, has, uh, have their own patio. And we thought that in a collective housing project, we try to uh, get this uh, quality of uh, stereo space. And we try to design the exterior space of each housing 
like a patio. Uh, you see the, um, the image from the competition. We designed this uh, trellis wall in order to limit the exterior space of its houses. This is the unit dwelling. We try to make bigger the living space connected to an open kitchen and also related to this exterior space uh, in the house. We also design this unit dwelling with the capacity to uh, be able to flip the dwelling. It doesn't matter if the dwelling uh, have the living room and the terrace in one part or in other part. And this uh, strategy creates that diversity in the volume. And if you think from the design of the unit dwelling, you get a, a strong uh, urban friendly scale from the urban, urban perspective. We imagine that all these kind of facade the neighbor had in, in their own uh, housing uh, could be the, the future image of our building. And maybe they are going to customize their own patio terrace. And the exterior space in, in a housing could be also uh, like a garden. We, in this project, we are in Madrid. In Madrid, we have, a very, we have problems with the regulation about the exterior space in the house, because uh, that exterior space count like a uh, gross maximum area in, in the building. And in social housing, you cannot uh, lose maybe six housing to get this stereo space. We, we are in this project, uh, 10, uh, 100 dwellings. And we try to think in a creative way how we could um, have this stereo space in housing. And we find uh, this solution. We can use the rooftop of the building and create this kind of atmosphere in the top part of the building. And um, now I'm going to finish the lecture with this project, Vallecas 47, the first uh, one project, built project for the office. And I'm going to try to explain you from the, this concept I saw you and how we deal with each concept in this project. In, from an urban perspective, we are in this uh, area in Madrid. This is a new extension area. And uh, this is the old part of Villa de Vallecas in Madrid. In the left hand side, you can see the complexity of the old part of the city, only three, uh, no more than three story high, very narrow street, uh, complexity in use. And in the new uh, part of the city, there is this kind of uh, large building, wide street where nothing happens. We have to deal with this uh, location. We have to develop this period in only one quarter of a closed block. And we design uh, the building with this kind of three, three different kind of uh, strips um, that is, is slides from one from each other in, in the floor plan and also in, in elevation. You can see these three different uh, strips. 
maybe one of these uh, fly over the uh, street, other one set back from the street. And when the building meets the street, the ground floor, uh, um, we connect uh, the city to the courtyard in the, in the project. We try to foster that kind of relationship, the visual uh, connection from inside to outside. And it feels like it's a safe space uh, to the city. Also, you can access by car. And we designed the parking garage in, in a way that you can perceive all the space from one point of view. And it seems uh, a space, uh, a safe space. The main access uh, from the street, you go directly to the courtyard. And from the courtyard, you can access to four different vertical cores. We try to create a community in these common spaces. And we design all the um, common spaces, the uh, vertical cores with the uh, staircase uh, very open to the views. And uh, there, is, uh, there are open spaces, exterior spaces in the project. And if you go up with the elevator and go out, uh, you can see the views overlooking the courtyard. And maybe uh, these spaces uh, are places where you can uh, spend some time um, uh, taking sun. Here you can see the three uh, strips in the project. The common strip, uh, very open, and these two strips are related to the dwelling unit. Here you can see uh, dwelling, the dwelling unit. We have um, access uh, from one vertical uh, core to two dwellings or three dwellings in the corner. And in the dwelling unit, we thought that in we thought that uh, there is a kind of a space, uh, an intimate space uh, related with the bedroom and the bathroom. And this is the white strip. And there is another kind of space in housing. It's more related with uh, social act, uh, the living room space. And is this, uh, it has this materialization with a glass facade. We try to foster in this project the relationship between uh, neighbors from uh, maybe the living room and the common spaces. You can see in this image how could be these kind of relationships. And also, uh, we try to get an exterior space in this building, but this building is in, in Madrid. And we have uh, the problem I told you before. And I saw you this reference image. It's a building in the center of Madrid. And you can see how uh, before the current regulation, a uh, building usually have terrace, but uh, uh, they start closing these terrace. We thought, we think that is uh, maybe for, because the city is hostile, uh, there is, too much uh, traffic, noise, and um, pollution. And the current regulation tried to deal with this um, image of the building and reduce the problem because usually it's not easy to see a building in Madrid with terrace. But we try to get that exterior space in the house 
because we think it's very important to have this stereo space. And also I think uh, during, the, during the lockdown, everybody feels that uh, the city could be uh, another kind of city without pollution, without noise. And we, I think we live our, uh, in our homes in a different way. And I think because of that, the exterior space uh, in a house is very important. And we try to get this in this social housing project. We cannot lose uh, maybe three dwellings to get it this uh, stereo space, but, uh, but we have to think in a creative way. And we, we thought that maybe an interior space like the living room can change to an exterior space. And we can transform a living room in a terrace completely, but it's possible because we have these uh, strips uh, with glass facade uh, in, with a corner facade completely open. And this is because we slide each strip from each other to get this image of, this, of, the, of the house and to get this, this idea of uh, exterior space in the house. I am going to finish the lecture with this image, and I would like to convey, to convey that uh, nowadays you are a student, but in the next future you are going to be architect, and you, you are going to deal with some problems, maybe regulation problems, but you have to believe in your ideas, because um, if you think in a creative way, you are going to find a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Marina, for uh, a really quite a phenomenal uh, uh, lecture. Uh, uh, and I have to say, uh, one of the things that I uh, enjoy the most about your lecture uh, is the way that you present a your projects multiple times, right? From different points of view uh, it, that in many ways show uh, the uh, um, it, the plurality uh, of ideas that are synthesized in the development uh, of a project, in this case, specifically uh, housing. Uh, maybe uh, uh, while students sort of start typing questions uh, 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 on the chat, uh, I might start with, a, a, uh, uh, with an initial sort of question uh, or comment, uh, which has to do uh, with regulations and how you address them, right? Because you actually uh, said a comment that I think for me, it was very important, which is that uh, the competitions and certain regulations from the part of the city uh, ask for certain questions of standardization. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you're interested in questions of innovation. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak uh, and give maybe a couple of examples where these two have been in conflict and how you've addressed it. Okay, yes, this is a very important aspect for us, a good question, because I think in reality, uh, if you work as an architect, you have to deal with this problem, uh, the regulation. And uh, I think, um, you have to think in a very creative way. <laughs> and this uh, problem could be an opportunity to get uh, a better architecture. Um, we deal with this kind of project, with, with this kind of problem in, I think in every project I saw you. If you, if you saw in the same part, in the first part of the, of the lecture. Because I think uh, in Spain, uh, the new urban, uh, urban strategies usually um, develop a, a scale of, of uh, buildings 
bigger than the old part of the city. And we are very concerned about this and we try to uh, relate uh, our building to the pre-existing city. And uh, for example, we, um, in order to develop this kind of building, we, we, we have uh, too many meetings with uh, city planners to try to uh, convey our ideas and to deal with the regulation to find a way to um, to justify our ideas and justify our our project, but they think um, if you if you believe in your ideas, I think uh, you you will be strong in this in this meeting and could be possible to change the way of thinking. Um, uh, I don't know if I, if I answer your yeah, question. No, I, think, uh, that's, uh, 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 I think it's a great answer. And I think, uh, 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 of course, uh, I always say, if you don't believe in your own ideas, nobody yeah. else is going to believe them, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, a, a huge part is believing yeah. in them. And then being able to speak a, a language where you can convince a, a larger audiences with uh, specific arguments. And I, I, I think that that's something that uh, the two of you do amazingly work, uh, amazingly well throughout, uh, throughout your projects. Uh, we have a question by Natalie uh, Zulpas. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, your projects are amazing. You describe several of your plants as a snake uh, that creates public spaces through its shape. How do you maintain privacy for the units directly above the courtyards? Uh, in the uh, La Scala and the Stair project with this uh, snake-like uh, floor plan, the courtyard are uh, inside the plot of the building. The, the courtyard are uh, private space, but common spaces. We try to create a transition between private spaces and public spaces. And the common spaces uh, in a collective housing project is the link between these two kinds of spaces. The courtyard in this uh, project are uh, common spaces. Mm -hmm. And we try to relate it to uh, other common spaces in the upper level. And also we try to relate it to housing and to the city, because uh, we try to relate this kind of ground floor in the building with the city and uh, with a very open connection, visual connection. And this is how we deal with this uh, situation that uh, I was trying to explain to you uh, and it's, it's about what happened when the building meets the street because it's a very important uh, part uh, to develop in in the project of a collective housing building i think in all every project but in collective housing building i think it's especially important Thank you, Marina. Jose, go ahead. or Maria. Yeah, I can go. Yeah, well, or you can go, Jose. Please, Maria, I'll, I'll go after. Well, no, Marina, first of all, thank you very much for this amazing lecture. Yeah. Super inspiring for us and the students. I've been following your practice for a long time in Spain, and I think you have been like uh, one of the best ones, the best practices in collective housing for sure. And I was fascinated about something that you always push a lot in your project and is um, this relationship between terrace window and the outside and the inside, no? And especially how um, 
you make it possible that, uh, to change the space, no? the space condition in different uh, seasons with some very, very small movements, no? like the windows in this last project that it was the, the first project you made, the first project you made. No, and um, how you reinvent no, this uh, relationship between uh, inside and outside, but in, in dwellings, no? in collective housing in a dense and compact cities. So I was wondering, and this is maybe opening a debate a little bit, no? how do you see the future of the dwelling or the housing unit no? uh, in collective housing buildings in post-pandemic era? No? And if you think that uh, we will prioritize now these forgetting spaces in the big cities, that is the terraces, or, for example, if we are going to prioritize or not uh, to have more partitions now that we are working online and with more people. So the sharing space and the very open space maybe is going to shift now. And if the, I don't know, the developers maybe you know, are starting to listen to what is the demand of the society in this post pandemic area. I don't know, it's opening a debate. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's a very good question, Maria. Uh, we thought about this idea a lot, if you saw in the in the presentation, and we we thought that uh, we think that uh, the housing has to be the has to have the capacity to change. I think in the lockdown we. Uh, we live, we, we, we perceive uh, for the first time that maybe our houses uh, are not uh, prepared to uh, adapt a new situation. For example, the working space inside the house and I think that the housing has to be bigger. The first one, bigger, has to be bigger, has to be flexible because uh, it has to be the, the capacity to change, to adapt to different cycle of life, to different needs. And for example, the idea to develop the project to get um, new access, the possibility to get new access. I think this is a good idea because, and I think it's, it's very important in the beginning of the design of the collective housing project. If you think about this uh, idea, like a first concept, you are going to get some kinds of dwelling, but not other kind of dwellings. And if you are able to get this secondary access or other kind of access, maybe your dwelling uh, have the capacity to transform, uh, to introduce new, new use. Uh, uh, and uh, housing with the capacity capacity of flexibility, uh, it hasn't to be uh, fluid space, no connected space. It's more than this. Uh, for me, it's more like a sequence of spaces. If you design spaces that could be a living room, could be a bedroom, could be a bathroom, could be an office, uh, your housing are going to be able to change and to adapt. But if you design the, with the idea of a bathroom is like this, and the size is like this, and a bedroom is, less, is like this, and a master bedroom is like this, you are designing a housing with very strict limits. And uh, it's not going to be um, a flexible house. It's not going to have the capacity to transform the space. And in collective housing, I think it's very difficult to do it because you have to deal with the concept of the housing unit, but you have to deal also with the optimization of the um, square meters or about 
common spaces in the building and the optimization of the vertical core. And there is uh, layers uh, with complexity in this kind of project. But I, I find this kind of complexity very interesting. And this is the kind of work I'm, I'm passionate to do it. And uh, you have to deal with this all input and put it together and try to do the best project you you can do no but yeah the yeah we used to is... say that it's like a sudoku no <laughs> it's a sudoku. put all the pieces <laughs> together and try to like you know struggle to 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 put it no yeah, okay. yeah, no, yeah I, exactly I exactly yeah thank you thank you marina for the answer you're welcome yeah so thanks so much, Marina. Really a fantastic presentation, incredible body of work. Um, so, so moving also uh, for us and for the students to see it. Even those that aren't here certainly will see it um, afterward in, in YouTube. Um, we have a question by, by a student, Gwen. Um, I, I wonder, Gwen, if you want to ask the question out loud. Um, yes, uh, sure. So I... I'm, it's kind of the same with Maria said earlier a little bit, but I really find the concept of bringing exterior and in, exterior into ex, interior because I never really think of design as that way. I always think, oh, okay, the window, looking outside, that's sort of like the views, but I never think of kind of merging them together. And I came when you was like the last four minutes and I saw your building with the extruding and the the area leading out, it was just amazing to me. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. So I was thinking like, what are some strategy that you have in designing them? And also I love the idea that you just mentioned about flexibility because in my studio work right now, I'm trying to learn like design, how a space can be as flexible and as dynamic by moving parts. And I gotta say, I have a prop, like some problem really thinking, okay, it make it flexible, but how does it make it work and combine together? So if you could also talk about like some strategy in terms of making a space flexible as well and like how to overcome, I don't know if you talked about it earlier or not, but uh, how to overcome those design problems mm -hmm. because I definitely <laughs> struggle a lot, uh, but I found them very fascinating. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, the first part of your question, no, how we deal with this uh, kind of uh, relationship between interiorized and exterior, no, the duality of the space. Uh, in the last project I saw you, uh, it start with uh, uh, the idea we believe that uh, the housing project has to have an exterior space. And we cannot uh, design in a conventional way because it was not possible. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, lose uh, three dwellings in this project. And for this, we try to design a space with two qualities. This is for example, a principle about flexibility. If you are able to design a space that is possible to function in two different ways, you are uh, designing a space with uh, this flexibility. Maybe the change in the use could be, for example, a place where you can live, uh, uh, sleep, or maybe a place where you can work, but also the space could be an interior space transforming in an exterior space, like Vallecas project, but you have to uh, have this strong idea at the beginning of the design, because I don't know if you un understand that in this project, this was possible because we, in the floor plan, we play with this slice 
between uh, the streets. And because of that, we designed the strips uh, with the glass facade uh, with these two facades, with a corner facade. We, we, we know that if you have an open corner, you are going to feel in a more much uh, open space that if you don't have a corner facade, if you only open one uh, one facade, uh, you don't see the image I saw you at the end of the lecture. And we try to get uh, this corner facade from the beginning of the designing. We start with uh, a strong idea from the unit housing, and we design a strong idea for the urban space with the same concern. And about the flexibility also, I'm not a, a big fan about uh, the mobility of pieces inside the house. I think, uh, I think uh, the old architecture uh, usually yeah, have a big quality of a space, big spaces, and these spaces has the possibility to change with uh, a room uh, only six square meters. I, I don't know if he, in feet, how, how many is <laughs> Maybe uh, 12 feet, I don't know. 12 feet, uh, square feet. Uh, I think it's difficult to transform the use. I think because of that, I. I told you before in the other question that we have to develop bigger spaces. I think the first principle to flexibility is bigger spaces and spaces with the possibility to adapt, to transform, to be something else. I think that was a fantastic response. And, and also um, I was just thinking our, our uh, newly named Pritzker Prize winners this year, uh, this year, uh, like Adorno Vasala, are also all about these flexible spaces. Um, so I think there's a lot of resonance there. Um, Marina, I have perhaps just a, a final question um, for you, um, which maybe has to do, I think, um, around uh, your approach to contextualism in across the projects. And I think Specifically, I'm talking about perhaps the social context, but I'm also interested in, in your ideas about maybe regional or geographic context. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating that you talked a lot about um, certain terms that we maybe don't hear so much about in architecture, like friendliness, um, or even the specific perspectives um, um, that a site or a city or a person offers. You, you mentioned the friendly urban scales, the pedestrian city point of view, uh, the pedestrian point of view versus the city point of view and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it seems to me that you were, you've you specialized, um, you and your practice uh, have specialized in understanding the Spanish social context quite well, which seems to be informing all of these contextual and site uh, strategies. But I'm wondering, even when you've gone from region to region um, in Spain, for example, Sevilla, Madrid, Barcelona, all of these different spaces, uh, um, uh, cities that you, you've worked in, um, I, I was wondering how your, your approach um, to understanding these everyday people um, ha has changed. Maybe specifically, like, would you say that the strategies that you presented, for example, the opening of the ground floor plan or the Edward Hopper-like experience at the ground level, um, the flexibility of the spaces you were just talking about, et cetera. Would you say that can be applied broadly in your projects and then modified slightly across the different regions? Or is it something that maybe changes fundamentally based on every single context that you tackle? I'm just curious about that. Okay, thank you, Jose, for your question. <laughs> um, 
I think the the main approach of all the project are the same, and uh, we adapt to the site uh, related to the climb. Um, because we design a project from uh, atmosphere. We try to get atmosphere in our project. And uh, for example, uh, we, we want to create uh, buildings um, related with uh, people, not, uh, not like models. We, we want to design a building where people um, live uh, and enjoy their own spaces and uh, foster the um, community, the relationship. We, we thought that uh, if the building is, uh, is, is kind, no? with people they are going to live, people feel like their homes and they are going to take care about the common spaces of the building because in collective housing is very important this part of the building, the common spaces. If you design these common spaces with this capacity uh, to be uh, comfortable with uh, the neighbors and to foster this kind of relationship, um, for us is important. I think this is uh, also related with uh, related to the uh, Spanish culture. No, we are very social uh, people, and I think uh, this is good. But in some buildings, if there are not good design, this uh, social connection could be a problem. And we have to deal with this, but we have to, we, we want to foster this kind of relationship because we think it's, it's, uh, it's very cultural from, from Spain. And we, we want to uh, design architecture uh, very uh, link with the place. And because of that, there are aspects like social aspect, cultural aspect, that we try to introduce in our design, in our design. But also there are uh, aspects like urban aspect uh, that we uh, is like a feeling. We try to create. Uh, we try to design project that people from the street can fill uh, this kind of space like they are comfortable in the city and I think when you design a building you are designing a part of the city and this is very important don't lose it you are designing a part of the city it's not a model is not uh, only a piece that you can put in other part of, uh, of the wall. No, you are designing a building in this plot with this climb, with this orientation, uh, with these people, with the culture of the people. And you have to deal with the, all, all this aspect. All this aspect, I think, are no technical aspect, are no uh, one vertical core, uh, some square meters, no. But uh, there are very important aspects in architecture because architecture is a space and the space uh, affects how people feel. And we try to uh, design a space of the city where people feel uh, comfortable and a space of the building where people feel like their own homes. And you, you have to deal with this to scale the city 
and the housing unit. And with these two atmosphere, and with these two uh, level of spaces. Thank you, Marina. That was wonderful again. Um, and again, thank you so much for your time today and energy and just the really amazing and thought provoking work. Mm -hmm. I, I truly enjoyed it. And it'll be parts of all our conversations with the students um, for the rest of the semester, no doubt. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Marina. Super inspiring. For sure, we can take the next exercise with a lot of energy and good vibes, no? And, and, and a desire to do something as you are doing in your practice, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you for the invitation. Of course. Thank always. You. Yeah, we hope we can invite you in the future, but to come to Charlottesville. <laughs>